and I'm going to share my screen. I, I have a brief overview of the department, uh, the program, how it works, uh, the nuts and bolts, basically, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, maybe if we'll go around before we start, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, yourselves, and what your programs you're interested in, and we can uh, specifically tailor or answer any questions that you might have regarding specific programs. Uh, how about we'll start with Connor. Uh, where are you from and uh, uh, are you any particular program that you're interested in, in hearing about? Um, well, I'm Connor I'm from New York actually, uh, Red Hook, uh, kind of like 45 minutes from Albany or so. Okay, so you get a lot and of snow up there, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm really interested in environmental engineering. Okay. And just and how about Rose? Welcome. Hello, um, I'm also interested in environmental engineering. Um, I'm only in 10th grade, so I still am considering other majors and stuff. Um, well, so, okay. yeah. yeah, so biology or chemistry or biochem are also interesting, but as well as environmental engineering, I don't know that much about it, so. Okay, so great. And how about John? I'm from Mifflinburg, Pennsylvania, right in central PA. Um, yeah, I'm just mostly interested in environment and uh, environmental engineering as well. Not really anything specific yet. But. Okay. And how about, uh, uh, I'm apologize, is it Eliza, 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 what's the? From Eliza. Eliza, and okay. I'm from Reading, Pennsylvania, and I'm um, interested in environmental engineering. Okay, great. All right, well, as I said, I'll start um, the presentation. It has a, um, a general overview of our programs, who we are, how it works, uh, what you can do with this degree, what the job market looks like. And then we'll, we'll um, and basically also we'll show you the, the great facilities that we have, and then we'll open it up for any questions or anything specific you'd like to, to, to talk about. Okay, I, hopefully the screen's showing up okay. Yep, I can see it. Everybody see it? Okay. Okay, well to start off with, um, we have a great set of faculty, almost everything you would be interested in about the environmental field we've got color covered. Um, we've got, um, in our department, we've got environmental engineers, we've got geologists, we've got environmental scientists. Um, just to briefly introduce, we've got our Dr. Anaya, who's an environmental engineer, uh, does nanotechnology and surface and groundwater uh, contamination treatment. Uh, Dr. Finkenbeiner uh, is a paleoclimatologist, one of our geology professors, and actually he's featured in the, in the video that I'll we'll look at tonight. Uh, Dr. Frederick is an environmental engineer, uh, teaches the water and uh, wastewater courses. Uh, Dr. Karimi, who's on, on, um, on the talk with us tonight, is also an um, assistant professor of geology. His uh, specialty is uh, geophysics and also with uh, GIS and uh, remote sensing. Uh, Dr. Carney, who's also joining us tonight, is an environmental engineering assistant professor. Um, expertise in air dispersion, modeling, and air quality. Uh, Dr. Murthy, who's currently the interim dean, is another air pollution uh, expert. And um, Dr. Whitman is um, another environmental engineering professor whose expertise is water quality and hydrogeology. And myself, um, I'm an environmental engineer, and I have a background in, in uh, waste remediation and, and currently involved in some of the sustainability um, initiatives that we have going. And we also have a great support staff. Uh, we have Colonel Castor, uh, retired Air Force veteran, uh, expertise in meteorology. meteorology. Uh, Mrs. McMonagle is our lab manager and also is geologist. And um, Mrs. Garrison, who's our great office manager. And we've got uh, some recently retired faculty um, that also will support our activities. Um, you know, as needed. Okay, now in our department, we have housed um, uh, several programs. We have the Bachelor's in Environmental Engineering, uh, the Bachelor in Environmental Science, which has two tracks, uh, Biology Concentration and Earth Science Concentration. 
And we also offer the BS program in geology. And also we have a, a bachelor's of art program in earth and environmental science, particularly for those that are interested in, in becoming um, um, secondary uh, education teachers. We also offer minors in sustainability management and geology, as well as for earth and environmental science, which are primarily taken by majors outside of our, our programs. Okay, I also wanna point out that starting this fall, we recently had two new programs approved. Uh, one is a certificate in GIS science, and um, the second is a BS program in civil engineering. And there will be more announcements and more info available on our website as these programs get launched. So I just wanna make you aware of that as you consider your options uh, for um, college, okay? Now you might ask, we have, you know, it seems like we've got environmental engineering, we've got environmental science, we've got geology in one department. You know, why aren't they separate? Why are they together? We find that this works very well because any environmental problems addressing them are, are multidisciplinary. All three fields require a strong background in chemistry, physics, and mathematics, and biology. And then typically when you get, would graduate and would be working in the field, you're gonna be a part of a team that's gonna be um, charged with solving an environmental problem. And I'll give you a, a, an example from my own background. Uh, my background before I came to Wilkes, I worked for a number of years um, as a, with what's called environmental contractors. And my um, main focus was cleaning up uh, hazardous waste sites. So they could be as large as Superfund sites that have multiple hazardous contaminants, or it might be something like a leaking underground storage tank from a gas station. So you may ask, why do we need so many different people with different backgrounds to solve this problem? Well, as you can see in this diagram here, when a, a, gas, a gas tank leaks and the gasoline gets into the subsurface, it can contaminate the groundwater as, as seen here. It can contaminate the soil. And depending on the properties of the petroleum product, or particularly if it's gasoline, it can either float on the top of the, of the groundwater there, or it can dissolve into it. And then as it travels, it can eventually contaminate a well that might be somebody's drinking water source. Well, when I worked for the contractor, we were charged with coming up with um, solutions for cleaning up this leaking gas. So we would have a geologist or also a hydrogeologist would be able to do assessment of you know, where the groundwater was located, how quickly it was moving, what direction it was going in. We would have an environmental scientist involved with knowing the level of gasoline contamination, where was it migrating to, how far had it gone. And then the engineer would be involved with designing a, a way to capture the gasoline, perhaps bring it up above ground to treat it or create a situation where in place treatment technologies would work and, and successfully clean up the groundwater site. So myself as an environmental engineer, my background is with something called bioremediation where we would use bacteria to clean up the contaminants. The, my, the gasoline is very amenable to being broken down by existing or native microorganisms. So I would work with the geologist and the environmental scientists to basically know how much gasoline had spilled, what direction it was going, and what we can do to optimize the site conditions to clean up that spill. And I was gonna say, I, I was fortunate to be involved with a number of um, successful cleanups or what they would call remediations of these sites, but it's very much a team effort with everybody, um, the geologists, the environmental scientists, bringing their expertise to the table to coordinate that uh, to successfully clean up the contamination. So we very much model our programs like you would see or the experience you might see when you after you graduate for addressing environmental problems because they are very multidisciplinary. Okay. We also, as I said, as an environmental professional, you need to have a lot of tools on your belt to solve these problems. So we're fortunate that we have state-of-the-art equipment um, and labs where you get to use this equipment. In other universities, you may not see this equipment or get to handle it until you might be in graduate school. So we have 
uh, global positioning system, geographic information system and remote sensing computer lab. We have a water quality lab with all kinds of analytical equipment, uh, air quality lab that we'll see a short video with a hydrology lab, a geology and rock and mineral lab, a tectonics lab and lots of field grip. We try to get out as much as possible. All our courses, our majority of our courses have a lab component. So you're always gonna be out in the field. We're fortunate located near Wilkesbury, we have things that we can get to very readily or sites that we can get very readily to that we use for our teaching. Let me show you um, a short tour of our, um, we'll start off with our earth and environmental science labs. Hey there, I'm Dr. Matt Finkenbinder. I'm a geology professor at Wilkes University in the Environmental Engineering and Earth Science Department. And uh, today I have this stream table set up. Uh, this is a uh, EM2M river stream table. And uh, it's filled up with a whole bunch of uh, this sand-like material. It's a microplastic. It's got a recirculating pump. And this is something that we use in our uh, introductory and upper level environmental science and geology classes to simulate natural processes like erosion and deposition uh, in natural river channels. And uh, I'm here with the augmented reality sandbox is the most amazing sandbox, uh, in my opinion, you'll ever see. <clears throat> so we've got all this sand in here. We've got a 3D sensor and a projector and a computer. And the way it works is that as we move the sand around in real time, the elevation is sensed, it's sent to the computer, and the projector ends up rendering a color topographic map uh, of the sand. So we would use this in uh, a variety of our classes in the EES department to uh, help us understand contours, topographic maps, uh, and how landscapes vary across states. I'm here in the uh, rock preparation lab, and uh, we do a lot of different things in here. Uh, right now I'm at the rock trim saw, and what I'm going to illustrate is how we can cut rocks uh, with this saw to uh, make them smaller. And uh, we do this for teaching purposes and also for research uh, to really kind of help prepare the rock for further analysis. That's, you know, not exposed to the elements and weathering. And that really, um, it helps for teaching to, to uh, kind of illustrate what's inside the rock. Um, that fresh surface is the best view for things like description and uh, classification. So after we mount the rock sample onto a glass slide, I'll uh, put it in this machine called a thin section. And it mounts on here. And we slide it down into the instrument. And it grinds the sample until it's thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And you can see that we go from a sample this size down to slightly thinner. And we continue to grind that until the rock sample is very, very thin. And that aids in our ability to see the individual mineral grains when we put this under the microscope. Hi, my name is Dr. Creighton, and I'm a geophysicist at Wilkes University, and uh, my research involves a lot of shallow surface geophysics to understand what's going on in the subsurface of the Earth.
So seismic data sets, as well as other types of geophysical data sets, like electrical data or gravitational data, can be used to find resources, to measure the depth of groundwater, to track contaminant plumes in the subsurface when there are major oil and gas spills or other contaminant spills in an area. Um, usually, seismic, though, is used a lot for finding hydrocarbons, oil and gas, and we use several different methods of seismology to find these resources in the first place. What we've been doing in the field today has been refraction, but there are also reflection methods as well. So I tend to use geophysical uh, data sets to understand a variety of different scientific problems. Uh, we try to use seismic and electrical data to better understand the depth to the slip surface for a lot of landslides to figure out how deep they are. We also use this to track uh, water in the subsurface for a lot of projects that I work on. And I use gravity and magnetic data to understand the tectonic development of the Appalachian Mountains in our area. Okay, and then we'll look at the one, uh, this is Dr. Uh, Carney um, in her air quality lab. Hi, my name is Sarita Carney. Uh, I'm a new assistant professor over here at Department of Environmental Engineering and Earth Science, Wilkes University. I started in 2018 fall, and my research experience has been in air quality. I teach uh, 105, which is basically the introduction to global environment for non-science majors. It's an environmental engineering class. The, I do the lab part of it, and then I also teach uh, solid waste management for the seniors of environmental engineering uh, department and uh, the wastewater lab, air quality, and air pollution control. And this is the research lab I usually work in. It's called as the air quality lab. As I said, my research focus has always been in air quality. So I'm gonna show you guys some of the instruments which we use in the classroom and also for my research. Uh, when you talk about air quality, you're talking about different pollutants or different things released into the atmosphere or air by different sources like cars, industries, uh, even inside your house, cooking, cleaning, or using your personal care products. So uh, when you talk about it, most of the time you are uh, focused on what could cause health effects to you or when you breathe in or when you're exposed to them. And particulate matter or dust in the air is one of the biggest concern. Sometimes they call it as aerosols also. Uh, when you talk about research terms, and especially in this situation of COVID-19, uh, aerosols are the biggest carriers of your virus. So in the lab part component of the classes, what we teach for the students, we show them different instruments, how to use different instruments and measure these pollutants, what cause you the health effects. So here's one of the instrument over here. Um, this one is used for the lab class, these both. They measure the particulate matter or basically the solid particles in the air or dust in the air. When you talk about dust in the air, you're talking about different sizes. Um, you could have heavier particles, which pretty much you could see pretty much like your sand, or soil uh, particles, they're heavy, so they settle down easily or they settle down over time. But what we are interested in is the particles which are very small and you cannot see with your eye. They're pretty much smaller than the uh, diameter of your hair, which we call it as the fine particulate matter or ultra fine particulate matter, which have the diameter of 2.5 micrometers, imagine. Uh, micrometers, it's very much smaller. The human hair is said to be 50 to 70 uh, micrometers, so you're pretty much talking about uh, a, a lot of size down to your human hair. Okay? And nanoparticles or ultrafine particles are the ones which are less than one micrometer size. So if you breathe, you cannot see them. You pretty much, if they're in the air, they're not going to settle down also. And when you breathe them in, they get into your uh, lungs and they pretty much form a layer of deposit on your respiratory system 
and cause health issues. So that is the biggest challenge. And I guess when you sneeze or when you're coughing, those particles get outside and whatever bacteria or virus you have in the air will use them as a surface to attach and travel. So that's why in the COVID situation, everybody's worried about the particles and you're told to cover your, I guess your face uh, with a mask, okay? So he, these are some of the things which we use. So they measure what's called as PM 2.5, which is 2.5 micrometers or less than that. When you talk about that, it measures the uh, mass in a certain volume of air. So, and also some of these instruments, they measure what's called as formaldehyde, which comes from smoking of your cigarettes. So when you're indoors, when people are smoking, uh, you have not only the particles which are released into the atmosphere, but also formaldehyde. So both of these instruments have the capability uh, to measure particulate matter and also formaldehyde. And this one over here, we use in the 105 lab. It also measures what's called as the volatile organic compounds, which is when you have your cars or when you have your vehicles, you use gasoline or diesel for combustion in your engine, so, which is nothing but your organic carbons. And when you're burning them for the energy to move your vehicle, sometimes the engine, the combustion is not complete or the burning is not complete. So you have some of the organic compounds released into the atmosphere, which also cause some health effects when you breathe in. Now you might say, I'm not standing near the exhaust of the car, why should I worry about, right? But imagine the workers or I guess the people who are working in the automobile industry, right? The repairs and stuff. So that's one of the things we have to be worried about. And also when you're idling your cars and uh, you're in a close by distance, you have the, you're going to be exposed to those. So this instrument over here measures those also. I guess if you wanted to see, maybe you could take a quick look closer. Right now we are inside the building. So it is showing PM 2.5 as two micrograms per meter cube. That is actually still dangerous if you think about it, because if I'm going to keep breathing this two micrograms per meter cube uh, for a very long time, it is going to cause health effects eventually. So this is one of the instruments which we use at 100 level course. And then we have air quality class, which I teach and oh, in the spring semesters. And this spring semester, we're gonna teach it again. In that class, uh, we use instruments like this one. This is called as a P-Track. This is made by uh, TSI instruments. Now, the, this one, uh, the good thing is, it also measures the count of the particles. So when you talk about air pollutants, you should not only be interested in the concentration, which is the mass you're breathing in, and sometimes the count also matters. So you could use the count to measure how much mass we have. So this instrument over here measures the count of the particles. It counts basically. Okay. And we have, uh, as a new faculty member, I'm trying to establish my own research over here at Wilkes University. And this is one of the instruments uh, I hope to use for my research. It's also by the same manufacturer. I guess this is an advanced than this one. So in this case, this instrument measures, on, it only counts the particles. This one counts the particles and converts them into mass. And one of the things you should be worried about is the particles are releasing, being released into the atmosphere by cars, by industries, by natural sources like trees, the pollen, or whenever you have volcanic eruptions or wildfires. But how do you know which one is contributing how much? So another part of my research focus is trying to find out what are the sources and how much each source is going to contribute. So this instrument over here will help do that. So if you look at it, it has seven, five different sets and each one uh, it is designed in such a way that opening is of different sizes. So what we're going to do is we usually put these filters in there at each stage and we try to collect the particles less than a certain size on each filter. And now these particles, because they're released by different places or different sources, they have a chemical composition. So basically they're comp made of uh, your chemicals like chlorine or your uh, sodium, potassium, 
or uh, sulfates and nitrates, uh, what we learn in our chemistry class. So once the air dust is collected on these filters, we could uh, make them dissolve into water and analyze in the water what are the different concentrations. And based on that, we could find what is the source. So like for example, if it has more of aluminum, silicon, calcium, or iron, you would think it's more of the earth contribution. So maybe it's from the roadside unpaved roads. Or you have zinc and you have manganese those usually come from your catalytic converters. Your catalytic converters of your cars, eventually they wear down. So the more vehicles you're driving, I guess the more number of miles you put on it, wear and tear happens. So those also contribute to the particles into the air. And when you're burning, when you're cooking, when you're doing your barbecue and stuff, you have wood, you're burning the wood, which is nothing but your potassium and organic carbon into the atmosphere. So that's another part of my research focus is trying to collect the, the dust in the air and trying to do the chemical analysis of it and trying to find the sources. So eventually that data would be used by the regulators to find out what are the sources and how do we stop them or how do we control them. If it's coming from vehicles, I guess there's no way to stop it other than making the engine design better to last it longer than uh, and reduce the wear and tear of it. Or if it's coming from burning, which people you do sometimes in their backyards, and if it's too much, maybe trying to tell them not to do it so that way it is reducing, things like that. So that's one part of my research focus. And uh, we use it for the classes also. When the students do their project, term project in their classes, I encourage them to use this equipment and do some short-term um, projects so they can understand what it means to do research eventually. Okay, so as you see, we've um, you know got a, a lot of great equipment, state-of-the-art equipment uh, that students will get access to use um, both in the courses or as it evolved in, in research projects. Okay. Noted, we also try to get out as much as possible. We do have a, a, a suite of canoes that we'll take out to local places. Uh, for the geology courses, we have a, a fortunate in the area here. We've got a lot of great formations uh, to visit. Um, so we get out as much as we can with uh, our classes. And also, all three programs have what are called capstone projects, which basically are a um, either a year or it's going to be a year and a half now, a research project that students work on in, in teams. And these are some examples of the most uh, recent ones that are, have been going on. Uh, we do work with landslide susceptibility, uh, landslides fracture analysis, sediment analysis from local lakes, uh, looking at uh, for climate change, looking at uh, trends that way over time, um, looking at standards for, for, um, for different monitoring purposes, uh, hydraulic monitoring and water and wastewater systems, what happens as water moves through different types of piping materials, uh, looking at ways to improve water quality treatment, looking at different disinfectants, performing greenhouse gas inventories and developing climate action plans for, for local communities, as well as developing green infrastructure, for, uh, particularly for stormwater management. So these are some of the, the more recent ones that um, students have been involved with. And also we encourage students as much as possible to take part in internship opportunities during the summer or um, research opportunities. These are some examples of some past ones. Uh, Tina Pedeski is now actually Tina Miller. She's married, she's an environmental engineer. When she was here, she spent a, um, a summer in Germany uh, doing research. Uh, these are groups of students that were funded to go to uh, technical conference, conferences and present their research at these conferences. And actually several of them have won awards. Uh, Kristen was part of a team of Engineers Without Borders that went to Africa to develop a, a drinking water treatment. And um, 
the geo explorers have gone as well as um, other research projects have gone out to some of the national parks to do um, a research on particularly on a volcano movement using global positioning systems. And um, Another thing that we like to very much are, are proud of is that we publish a lot and very much the students have a, a, an opportunity to be in bar, part of the, uh, the, the, the publications. Uh, we encourage as much as possible and the university is very generous about student attendance at conference. And we've also got um, faculty with a lot of expertise that have written books or book chapters We've got professional engineers, we've got professional geologists and uh, three board certified environmental engineers. Also our faculty are, are officers in uh, professional societies at both the local, regional and uh, national levels. And this is a shot of a, a group of students that went, uh, I believe it was uh, what Dr. Carney two summers ago, right before the pandemic, that they got to go up to uh, at Montreal, Canada, and they were part uh, part of a uh, the Air Waste Management Association National Conference. And that's Logan here won separate place for his poster presentation at that conference. Yes, that's good. Okay, so you may ask, as with an as an, with an environmental background, what are some of the major issues? Well, we know that um, energy is going to continue to be looking for alternative energy sources or basically making what we have more efficient. So renewable energy is gonna get very big uh, issues with natural resources, uh, managing them better, looking for other options. Uh, environmental sustainability, uh, being smarter about how we build buildings, how we manage stormwater runoff, um, looking at climate change. Climate change is gonna be very much a, a big challenge that we're gonna be dealing with face, basically. Uh, infrastructure issues. We've got aging water and wastewater plants that are going to need to be upgraded. We've also got some new um, contaminants that are going to need our challenges that we're going to need to be uh, addressing. So as you can see, there's going to be plenty of work for environmental professionals um, for the years to come. And you might say, all right, I've worked very hard. What are my job prospects once I get out? You know, what kind of job can I get? Well, this is the most current information from the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics. It was published last September. Now we know the pandemic um, has affected things. However, we are gonna get through the pandemic. And once we do, uh, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of environmental problems that are gonna need to be addressing. As you can see with all four fields now, environmental scientists, geoscientists, environmental engineers, and as well as uh, civil engineers with just a bachelor's degree, they've got very good salaries um, and they all have projected job growth. So the good news is that your hard work with your degree from Wilkes will pay off and result with you getting um, you know, a very good and rewarding job as well as a, a, you know, a very well-paying job. And we also want to tell, we were recently informed that we were selected um, as number 11 from what's called grad reports, which ranks to our environmental engineering program uh, of tracking our uh, graduates on what their early career salaries are. So we were very, uh, you know, happy to hear about our ranking uh, in that. So basically you're getting good value uh, for your money with your Wilkes degree, and it will result in a, a good paying job. And you might ask, what can you do with an environmental degree, either a, a, as a, a geologist and environmental scientist or environmental engineer? Well, basically all kind of options. You can work with uh, consulting, private industry, with the state or federal agencies. You can work for environmental contractors. You could, you know, go to, to graduate school and we've had success with um, getting our, our graduates into some very good graduate programs, uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, Drexel, uh, Texas A&M, uh, Columbia, uh, to name a few. And we've also got uh, students in some of the top uh, consulting firms, such as uh, ERM, Gannett Fleming, um, CH2M Hill, Gordon Lawson, and so on. So on and so forth. 
We also very much can encourage uh, professional development, uh, particularly for the engineers. You're gonna get trained to become what's called a professional engineer. And the first part of that is to complete a, a degree program from an, a, what's called an ABET approved program. And then once you do that, you sit for an exam, typically taken your senior year. The exam is called the Fundamentals of Engineering exam. And once you pass that, you become what's called an engineer in training. And that typically does depend on what state you're gonna be working in, but it's typically four years after you get your um, engineer in training designation, you would work under the, under the tutelage of a professional engineers, and then you can sit for another exam and you pass that and you become what's called a professional engineer. There's also a similar path for geologists. Um, you can take, when you finish school, what's called the GIT or the geologist in training. And then after uh, several years, you can sit what's, what's called the uh, professional geologist exam. And also for environmental scientists, there's a number of certifications as well, perhaps as a, a qualified environmental professional or even um, for sustainability professionals or for green building, there's a number of these. And our program does a very good job at preparing you for these uh, for these licensure programs, okay? We also are fortunate that we have a very strong alumni network and we keep in contact with them. They serve as mentors for current students and they also uh, let us know when there's any openings in their organizations and we've been able to, to um, you know, share that knowledge and uh, you know, um, employ a lot of our recent graduates to our alumni network. And as I said, we've, um, are, we're very proud of our students. They've been winners of scholarships from international professional organizations. They participate uh, in international research experiences. They've been able to publish in peer reviewed journals and they participate in solving problems that are important to the, uh, the region. And we you know, will continue that as well once things settle down from the, the pandemic. And um, besides that on campus, we have a lot of very active programs. Uh, we do a lot of outreach, something called EES Day, where we bring in local students to learn about the environmental field. We're involved with Natural Engineers Week. We participate with local uh, stream cleanups. We've got involved with a program called WEBS, which is Women Empowered by Science, where we bring fifth and sixth grade girls to campus to, to show them about uh, different science activities and engineering activities. And we typically participate every year in the, um, a, a regional Earth Day where they bring over a thousand students to the park across the street from the university uh, that we uh, showcase different environmental uh, initiatives. And we're also affiliated both um, on the student level as well as the national level with the um, American Geophysical Union the um, Geological Society of America, the Society of Women Engineers, the National Society of Professional Engineers, the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists, and the International Society of Sustainability Professionals, to name a few. We have student chapters of the Air and Waste Management Association and the Pennsylvania Society of Professional Engineers. Uh, we also have a Geo Explorer Club that has been very active in traveling, uh, actually, this club is open to all majors on campus, and uh, typically they would go during spring break, and they've gone to places such as uh, Hawaii or the uh, national parks. And we have a, an active group on campus for students for environmental sustainability, where they do different environmental initiatives on campus. So um, these things, um, you know, are, are opportunities outside the classroom to get involved both uh, professionally as well as some fun activities. The geo explorers also go uh, hiking and uh, you know canoeing and kayaking uh, in many of the local uh, great resources that we have in the area. Okay, so just to summarize, um, you know, why you should be interested in our, our programs. We have a very strong curriculum. We have very passionate faculty uh, we have a very much of a hands-on approach. There's all kinds of opportunity to do field work and research. Uh, we have um, a network to get you either internships or co-ops. There's study abroad opportunities. And we have um, a number of, of very well-established 
student chapters. So with that, um, I said, I'll invite you to either, you know, keep in touch with us. We'd invite you to, you know, as soon as things open up to come visit us on campus. But in the interim, we can um, even set up a, a Zoom chat with you or, um, you know, have you even Zoom with some of our students if that would be an interest. Uh, this is their, our, our website on there. But we, you know, we love to talk to you. We love, everybody enjoys what they're doing. And, um, you know, we'd love to, you know, to, you know, to um, you know, answer any questions you might have about our, our programs or, or how you would fit in and uh, what, you know, what you can do with, with these degrees. So with that, I said we've got a good couple of uh, couple minutes. I'd like to see if uh, Dr. Carney or Dr. Uh, Karimi would like to, uh, um, you know, add anything. And if not, we'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have about the program. I'll just add one quick thing. And we've had a lot of students come to Wilkes University to take summer courses from other universities. And we've had students go on to graduate programs. And a lot of them tell us that one unique thing about the Wilkes Advantage or our department really is the access to equipment that most students don't get to test or play with until graduate school. So we send you out into the field with graduate level equipment because that's what we feel you need to be trained in to be on the front end of the curve when it goes to industry and your career. So that is definitely a huge advantage with our department. I would add to that, like Dr. Karimi said, that's true, not only in terms of equipment, but also software, because that's one thing we do. We have the industrial advisory board. So we try to talk to them and find out what is that you should learn to be able to work or get jobs right away. So the software, which I learned in my master's program, you guys are learning in the undergraduate junior level. So the program tells you that that tells you that program is very strong and you know, you're, I think th this will be a right choice. Another thing you want to think about is we have only undergraduate programs. So our faculty are, have open door policies and all of us work with you, you know, whatever time it takes to help you understand and, um, you know, provide you the support. So that's one thing you should think about also when you try to choose your university or uh, college where you want to go, because you want to go where you get more support, right? And now the quiz question. You're gonna get 10 extra credit points when you come join Wilkes University. I guess ready? John, I can't see you, John. Are you ready, John? I'm ready. Okay, <laughs> what one rule I violated in my video? What is the one rule I violated in my video? You didn't have a mask on. I don't know wow, if that's- Wow, John like gets 10 points. So when are you coming to Wilkes University, John? <laughs> um, I don't know. I got accepted, so I'm really excited about that. Hey, but that's good. So I'm going to see you pretty soon in one of my classes then. Then remember, 10 extra credit points whenever you come. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And whatever course you see me in, remind me that, okay? All right, I'll corroborate you. it if she backtracks. <laughs> it's being recorded, so there's a permanent record, right? So. And what is one other thing you guys noticed about me when you watch the video? Rose, do you want to take a guess? I'm not, I'm not sure. No, I, I'm I, my own voice, right? Remember, like I talked for 15 damn minutes. I mean, like, can you imagine that? <laughs> hey, I mean, Actually, it was only 10 minutes. <laughs> it's only 10 minutes. But yeah. still, I, I used to hate when my professor, I had meetings with my advisor. I was like, man, he can't stop. When is he going to stop? But I feel like now I've become him. And it's like, <laughs> I like hearing my own voice. And I just keep talking just to hear my own voice. No, you had important things <laughs> to say. So, uh, so Connor, yeah. are you also accepted student? Oh, what is your status, Connor? Um, yes, I was accepted. Ah, so we're going to see you soon, too. Uh, yes, I'm probably I'm still going through some of the other acceptances that I've gotten and I'm comparing. the. No, 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 no. You should you should <laughs> think about Wilkes. Well, no, Wilkes. Wilkes is definitely in top three. It's a there's like 
I've got like three colleges that are tied right now. Okay. How about uh, most of you weren't from the area. Any questions about Wilkesbury? We're supposed to have the best pizza here, right? We're one of the pizza capitals of the world. So, <laughs> I mean, that's a strong <laughs> statement. <laughs> old, old Forge, Old Forge. If you look in the, uh, um, yeah, but I think that's like self-appointed. Uh, oh no, pizza it's capital. From, uh, one of the food people. So, uh, so anyway, oh, there's so a. Funny. I yeah, feel Wilkes like Barry. Chicago and New York would be offended, but <laughs> oh, they're they're actually they're up there. It's like the top ten. So Old Forge Pizza is actually up there. Yeah. That. But Wilkesbury Center is located. We're about what. Uh, two hours, roughly two, two and a half hours from Philly and New York. But from a, um, a environmental standpoint, we're very close to a lot of great parks and resources and trails. So we're fortunate that way. That's why we try to get out and do as much as we can uh, with our courses. Um, almost every course has a lab component. So you will be getting out there and, uh, you know, you know, getting, getting dirty and getting wet. So. Uh, yeah. Do you have questions for us? Um, I guess I have a question. It's more of a technical one, and I'm sure I can find this on the internet too. But when you were talking about engineering, you have to, you were talking about like a professional engineer versus another engineer. How many, I got a little confused. How many years do you have to like be okay, in school? Um, it's pretty much this way throughout the United States. Um, you, many places to call yourself an engineer, you have to have what's called a, a license. A professional engineering license and um, typically how it works you have to go to what's called an ABET approved program and uh, ABET is a third-party licensing that is throughout the United States I, th I think actually internationally that comes and vets the program uh, and actually ours is an ABET approved program we're actually getting ready for our next evaluation which is going to be next fall and so the first criteria is to graduate from an ABET approved engineering program and then you're allowed to apply and then you're allowed to sit for what's called the engineer and training exam. And it basically, it's called, or, or the fundamentals of engineering exam. And it teaches you basically on everything you should know as an engineer, you know, math, chemistry, you know, chemistry, uh, statics, dynamics, the mechanics of material. And then once you, and then in the morning part is general engineering. And then you can take in the afternoon, it's a, a, a six hour exam now, it's on the, uh, it's a computer based exam. And uh, you go to one of these test centers to take it. And once you pass that, and you can take the afternoon portion discipline specific. So um, you could take it either in environmental or civil um, for our purposes. You pass that and you become what's called an engineer in training. Now, most states, once you get that designation, you then have to work, and it's typically four years. Some states will give you credit for a graduate degree, either a master's or your doctorate. And you typically have to work like a, you know, like an apprentice under for four years under the tutelage of a professional engineer. And then you apply to the same group or the same state board. And um, you have to show your experience. You have to have so many hours experience um, doing certain engineering activities. They approve your application, and then you sit for what's called another exam, a professional engineering exam. And that's that right now, I think, is also um, eight hours exam. I think it's written, although they're, they're converting that to a, a computer exam, a computer-based exam. And you take that in your discipline. So you would either, you know, and there's one in environmental, there's one in civil, chemical, mechanical, whatever. And you pass that, and then you become what's called a professional engineer. Uh, so that's pretty much, it's a little bit, some states have, a, like in California, of course, they've got, you know, seismic out there with earthquakes, so they may have another component of their test. Uh, some states have another ethics component, but pretty much it's a, it's a standardized test that's taken throughout the United States, and then some states just have different criteria. So as an engineer, you could get licensed in one state or, or multiple states, depending on where you're doing work. And many places to call yourself an engineer, you have to have that license. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Marlon, no, Connor was, I'm um, oh, sorry, Connor wanted some clarification on, uh, I understand the EIT is more of a knowledge exam, but is the PE exam, the final one, more of a practical exam or is it? Um, yeah, it's discipline specific. So the, uh, the uh, as it sounds, the uh, EIT, the engineer in training or the fundamentals of engineering exam basically tests you 
everything you learn in your bachelor's of science program. So it's, the, you know, the, there's a, a set of courses that have to, you know, that all engineers take. So it's typically the, you know, the statics, the dynamics, the mechanics and materials, the math, all the way through calculus, differential equations uh, for the morning part in physics and chemistry. The afternoon is discipline specific and you would take it uh, and they'll test you in environmental engineering. So it would be on waste management, you know, water movement, water wastewater treatment and so forth. You pass that and then you become what's called an engineer in training. And then you would work in your area of, of expertise or area of interest um, for typically four years more. And then you sit for the professional engineering exam and that you would take either an, an environmental or chemical or civil, whatever type of engineer or electrical that you are. And the group that, that manages this, it's uh, called the National Council of Engineering Examiners, NCEES. So if you wanted more information or if you email me, I'll be glad to send you their, their website and that has all the information on that. And it's important if you wanted to consult on your own um, to have, or you know, many states to call yourself an engineer, you have to have the PE. Uh, you get more money as you would expect um, as, a, as a licensed engineer and you get more responsibility. So uh, our program, we, have a, we require all our students to sit for the exam but you still graduate no matter what. But it's better to take that EIT exam the closer you are to finishing your undergraduate degree. Most employers ask for that. They all want not only want you to be graduating from an ABIT accredited program, but they would love you if you have an EIT or FE exam cleared already. Because yeah. four years down the road, you could be a licensed engineer where you could pretty much sign or stamp on uh, review the designs or uh, protocols. Yeah. Or you be, could be an expert witness or you're designing or, you know, things of that nature. Now, I, I also mentioned several of us have our board certified in certain specialties too. So we have PE and that board certification is even more, you know, um, you know as a result of experience and, and knowledge in a particular area. So, uh, but I know in, in Pennsylvania, uh, tech, you know, you're not supposed to call yourself an engineer unless you've got the PE designation. So, the practical aspect is more on designing part. You're not going to build something, but you're going to design on paper, like to maybe designing a component of a wastewater treatment plant or designing an air pollution control device. Or that's the more practical questions you're going to face in both FE and PE. PE, it will be more detailed you have to really go into details of it. Effie, you're gonna to touch uh, base most of it. As I said, it's just a, basically, it's a, a testing on what you've learned on, in your undergraduate degree in the... Uh... And we have summer research programs, guys. I mean, that's one thing. You could do summer research with one of our faculty members. And, you know, like all of us are active in research. So you could spend one summer with us trying to do research. And maybe if you wanna pursue uh, graduation pro, uh, masters or something that'll give you a flavor of how the research is going to be trust me most of us even though we it's an undergrad program but we try to push you towards grad level research so you know you're going to get good experience so that's another uh, strong point i think in our program is that summer research capability for you guys to experience yeah, as i said our alumni met a network is very strong too. So you could actually get an alumni mentor to tell you about what, it, what it's like in the workplace and what kind of courses you should take or things like that. So there's all kinds of resources available. And also too, Wilkes is very much um, geared towards student success. So we want you to do good. We've got all kinds of resources. We've got something called University College that they have all kinds of tutoring and study support information. So if you wanna do good, and you know, you're willing to work hard, we're here backing you up and we'll you know, get you whatever you need to be successful. So, uh, so that's one of our, our strong points too, um, is that um, everybody knows everybody. I think most of us have you know, a lot of the students' cell phones, exam or cell phones, so we'll text them if they don't show up or you know, if they oversleep, we always tease them. So, we, you know, and um, so there's a, a nice relationship like that and you know, 
that uh john i don't know if you had any questions i wanted to make sure everybody got a chance to ask what they needed to anybody have questions at all or Cool, comprehensive presentation, excellent. I know, another thing you guys want to remember is you're not just a number in 100 students. You go to UT Austin or you go to Texas A&M College Station, you have 100 undergraduate students and you're one of them, but here you're out of what, 20? In 20, you're one. So we know, like Dr. Troy said, we know one-on-one. -on -one. It's not that we're gonna chase you where you are, but- But we're here- <laughs> Just you know. for your success. So. We want you to succeed. There's all, as you saw, there's so many environmental problems that are, need to be addressed, and we're counting on you guys to to clean up the the mess that everybody's created. So, uh, so you could be the mamas of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Your mom sure cleans up most of the house. Right? You get <laughs> the room, and then she cleans it up. So we could be the moms of the world. So Connor, you should decide and come to Wilts. <laughs> put it on the top one put it the first choice no second or third we don't like second or third we like being first you That's guys aren't name? second or third it's a tie it's a there tie you go. there's no tie there's no, not, not even any tie that's it wilkes and you're coming to wilkes so rose can follow your footsteps after a couple <laughs> of years right rose yeah, yeah. But I was just saying, I know despite the pandemic, uh, if you have any other questions or if you want to talk to some of the students, we'd be glad to set up like a Zoom chat with them. Um, if you, you know, just uh, till things settle down, we're hoping by the summer things will be more, you know, so we'd invite you to come visit us, of course. But if you can't, we, you know, we'd be glad to follow up with you or, you know, or, you know, you know uh, answer any questions or have you talk with the students about their experience here. And if you're uncomfortable with coming to campus, but want to perhaps like shadow virtually, we can probably facilitate having you to come and sit in on some of our classes that are going on over the uh, spring term. So that is definitely possible as well. Yeah, or no, if, through the admissions office too, they'll, you know, they can help you set that up or arrange it. So, you know, contact them, but if not, you can contact us directly. All right, I think we're, um, you know, about 7.30 or so. And I don't know if you're planning to go to any other sessions, so we don't want to keep you, but we want to thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with us tonight. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing you on campus and please keep in touch if we can answer anything uh, in the interim. And I think these videos also will be posted on the YouTube, right? I think these are hot off the press. I just got these this afternoon, but there's going to be some other ones. Um, and there's going to be some other, um, I imagine they're still doing the, um, other, they have other open houses or accepted student day type things um, with different workshops and stuff to, to give you a flavor for campus uh, as well. So, um, you know, as I said, so we hope to, to see you sometime in in, uh, in person and not uh, on, a, on a screen. It was a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, John, I didn't get to see you, but it was a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, too. Well, have a good day, guys. All right. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.